Well, thanks very much, ladies and gentlemen, for the opportunity to talk to you this afternoon. It's, um, I've, I have to say, I've really enjoyed this so far, and I've learnt an awful lot. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the discussion periods afterwards as well. Um, I think my theme for the, uh, for the, for the afternoon is, is never underestimate a microorganism. They might be small, but they can do an awful lot of damage. And so I, I hope to show you a little bit about that uh, as, as we go forward. I think the first thing I really do want to say is, is and I think Aubrey would agree here, that um, we're not here to try and frighten you. you know? We're not here to, to have you running out screaming because what we're showing you are, it happens, it does happen, and it's something that you should be aware of. And unfortunately, I believe that the only way you can keep on top of this is exactly what Aubrey's just been saying, which is you have to, you have to um, look for good hygiene, you have to get rid of the water if at all possible, you have to check on a regular basis and just keep on top of the whole thing. There are, there are biocides, there are lots of magic potions out there. Some work, some work a bit, some don't work at all. But none of them are the total answer. You will not get any one single thing that's going to solve your problem, I'm afraid, other than time, effort, and hard work. And I'm sorry to give you that message right at the very beginning, but you know, I think that's what it is. So what I, what I really want to talk about is um, overview here. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the other problems that arise in the marine environment, a bit about the organisms, how they grow, why they grow. Um, a little bit about how you actually detect them and look at them, because we'll hear more about that later on. And then a little bit about prevention and control. Okay, so the, the, problem, the problem organisms. Here they are, tiny little things, little bacteria, little yeast, moved on automatically. Um, these are about one mu, two mu perhaps, on their own, you can't really see what they could possibly do. This is one of the more common organisms that you find in fuel systems. This is a thing called Hormoconius resini, um, often called the jet fuel or the diesel bug. Um, and this is perhaps, you know, five mu, four or five mu when it's on its own like that. However, let them rip, let them loose, give them food in the right environment, and you can see significant problems. Now the sort of thing that you, you see is, is corrosion, you can get uh, etching of products, you can get blockages of pipes, you can get embrittlement of plastics. So you know, these organisms will have a, a, a go at quite a lot of wide range of, of materials. They'll attack plastics, you wouldn't think that perhaps, but they will go for, for plasticizers, they will etch, they will stain. They can damage metals, as we heard earlier on, and we'll see more about that in a moment. Um, they attack fuels, as we know, they attack coolants, lubricants, causing problems in waters, bilge waters, they, uh, they get around. And when they do uh, get around, whoops, I've just spoiled the... Apologies here, this is just somehow skipped. I spoiled this, you've seen all the slides now. There we go. I just wanted to give you a little bit of a, of a case history of an incident that happened in Auckland Harbour at the, um, the turn of 2008-2009 season. I wouldn't recommend the health and safety of, of sticking your hand into a, a tank and pulling out a fistful of this stuff, but this is, this is microbial contamination. This is a mixture of, of hormoconis, of other filamentous organisms, of yeast, bacteria. The problem was that at the beginning, the tail end of the 2008 series, the whole of Auckland Harbour received contaminated fuel, and this is acknowledged. It was probably had biofuel in it, but no one's ever actually proved this, but it probably had biofuel in it. But even if it didn't, you're going to see the, re the results. As a result of which, 
over sort of the winter period when boats were laid up, when people were, were, had them stacked away over the, the holidays, they had the opportunity to, to grow. The microorganisms grew rapidly in the, in the boats and in the fuel systems. Labor Day came along, which is sort of the, the spring bank holiday, if you like, in the equivalent in the UK. Um, people went out, turned the keys on, instant blockages, instant stop, and huge problems. There were over 600 boats of all types infected. The ferries were suspended. Um, they had leisure vessels, you know, the things that go out and take people to see, to see um, the whales, were in port for over two weeks, about 16 days. And on average, it was taking something like 27 to 30,000 New Zealand dollars per vessel to clean up. So they're quite small, but they can do an awful lot of damage. If you look inside a, a tank, this is in, inside a, a, an ordinary um, marine fuel tank. This is the sort of thing that you can see in the bottom of the tanks. If you then clear that away, then you can see the, the amount of material that's just left on the bottom. And this is a, a stainless steel tank, which we were mentioning earlier on. You clear the, the, the gunge away, and that's what's underneath. Significant amounts of microbially mediated corrosion. And that's the sort of thing that you can get, the sort of problems that you can get when you, when you take a look close up. So, you know, we're not talking about theoretical problems or theoretical damage here. It can happen. Basically, the microorganisms will, um, they'll, they'll go for the hydrocarbons, the alkanes that are in the, in the fuel. Um, and also, as we've heard, these days they will also use biofuel additives as, as a foodstuff. It's, a, it's nutrition for them. Now, this produces the biomass that you've just seen there. Some organisms, some different types, will also go for, for additives, and again, that causes a, a, a biomass buildup. <coughs> However, while they're growing, these things, like all of us, are producing waste materials. They're producing byproducts and metabolites, and many of these things are acidic. So, as well as the, the, the blockage, you actually get acid byproducts, which can cause the corrosion that you've, you've just seen in the previous photographs. And just pure damage to plastic linings or plastic tanks can occur because some of the, certainly the fungi can produce very high, high amounts of turgo pressure and they can actually bore. So you can, um, you can get damage to plastic tanks as well through microbial growth. These are just uh, the sort of things that you can see when you take a fuel sample. Um, different types of, of organisms. The ones on the left is it's mainly um, a bacterial fungal mix. And this is a traditional fuel you, where you see a, a water bottom and you get that growth at the interface. And you can see it's almost like a plastic bag, so a floaty plastic bag at the interface. And that's mainly bacterial, but there is some fungi in there as well. The one in the middle is, is mainly fungal. Again, you see the, the material at the interface there and what's What's happening is that that's the brown bits of corrosion products. And the one on the right is a, a sample from the bottom of a long-term storage tank, mainly bacterial, um, mainly things called SRBs, sulfate-reducing bacteria. And you'll get these at the bottom of, of tanks in, in ships as well, because very corrosive, cause large amounts of damage, and can be a significant safety hazard because they produce H2S gas. Um, also, what you'll see on there is it's not terribly convincing, I don't think, on the picture, but... The, um, the one on the far side, there is actually um, an emulsified layer between the fuel and the water. And it's actually, you can get very um, long-lasting, very stable emulsions being produced. So, as we've already said, that sort of growth can lead to corrosion. It can lead to, if you have uh, fuel probes in the tank, for example, because you've got large amounts of water in, the, in fungal hyphae and in biofilms, it can give incorrect probe readings. And then ultimately, you can get engine failure. So, a couple of photographs here to just show you the type of thing that can happen. 
This is, this is a pitting corrosion, and this is, is often caused when um, underneath a biofilm, when you get cells being produced, you get electrochemical cells being produced, and this is the sort of corrosion that results from that. Um, this, this is actually completely bored through. You can't tell from the photo, but it is completely bored through. Again, just an illustration of a, of a real sample from a, this is from a very large tanker um, in the Gulf. In this case, the fuel, the, the diesels, the light to dis middle distillate fuels were actually used purely when the ship was um, coming into port, when they, they couldn't give off on pleasant fumes. Um, and consequently, the, the fuel was standing around for quite a long period between usage. So it was used, and you can see here, the dark, the, the dark spots there are all mainly fungal growth in this case, actually in the, the filter there. And that was the material that was dug out of that. So some of that was, was purely traditional fuels. But as you've already seen, biofuels are actually beginning to prove problematic. We've heard about thames, and fame appears to actually enhance the susceptibility to attack. Added to which, the two, the the, um, the fame addition and reduction in sulphur appears, and there's no totally logical reason for this at the moment, but it does appear to enhance the two. The two together seem to increase the problem even further. We get a faster build-up of biomass we're seeing a, a larger number and a change in profile of the microorganisms that are appearing in biofuel containing fuels than the old traditional ones, which as a microbiologist is really interesting, but um, that probably doesn't make you feel any better. Um, we're getting increases in reports, certainly we as a laboratory in um, civilian vessels, and we've also seen um, problems, as you saw earlier, with land diesel issues in the UK and also in Singapore, New Zealand and Australia. So, why do they grow? How do they grow? We have this thing that we call the eternal triangle. And basically, for spoilage to happen, you have to have the organism, obviously. You have to have something for it to feed off and drink. And you have to have the correct environment. Water, not a lot you can do about that. If you remove any one of those essentials, you're okay. But water is, is inherently there. The potential is always present. We've heard about droplets being suspended in the fuel. Um, you get um, condensation occurring, which means that you're getting water bottoms. And also you can get water coming through from filters which means that overall you have to stay on top of the water problem. It'll, it'll continue to be there, so you have to be aware of it and you have to remove it as much as humanly possible. Because without water, no growth. Um, they need a foodstuff, and as we've already seen, they, they have that. They have the light to middle distillates in the alkanes in the actual fuel. Um, this is found in kerosenes and in diesels. We know that with the new biofuels, the fame additions are, are improving the life for the microorganisms. Gasolines historically have been quite low susceptibility, um, but we are seeing interesting things happening with, with ethanol being added to, to gasolines. Um, in, in terms of the environment, um, up to a point, the warmer the environment, the faster they'll grow, the bigger the problem. With increased humidity, the higher the humidity, the more water, the faster they will grow, the faster they'll reproduce. Having said that, in some cases, you don't really need that free sloshing about water, for, certainly for fungi, to, to get a hold and to start to, to multiply and potentially cause problems. Which means when you add all that together, I suppose, that the, the high risk areas, if you're operating between the tropics, um, high humidity, temperature changes, these all cause additional problems. The sort of environment where you may also see problems is, is laying up ships, for example, and there's quite a lot of that happening at the moment. Um, empty tanks being, ships being left with empty tanks and, uh, and just static, not moving around. 
So, how do we go about finding them? Well, the first thing is eyeballs. You know, that's, if you see a problem, by that time it's too late, you've got the problem. So what you're looking for is emulsification, um, or in the case of some biofuels, as we've heard earlier, actually you can have quite significant contamination without any visible, obvious visible um, presence. So black-brown particles, um, this plastic bag effect that we've seen at the interface there, corrosion products, um, slimes, black water, nasty smells, any of these can be um, indicators that you've got something unpleasant in the fuel. Uh, in addition to the warning from um, about the biofuels where you may not see, see um, problems, clear and bright fuel, often people say, okay, if the fuel's clear and bright, fine. But clear and bright fuel can happily sit on very unpleasant contaminated waters. So if we're doing a, a microscopic diagnostic activity. Um, we're looking for, down the microscope, we're looking for emulsification, as I've said, bacterial polymers, um, cells, yeast cells, bits of hyphae, bits of thread. And one of the lab-based tests is you simply um, filter the problem, the, sorry, filter the fuel, and you get hyphae that you can actually look at and count. Very old technique, not very, very good to carry out as a, as a laboratory person. Um, but sort of the, the next stage on from that is where you plate out the filter, and this is, this is the um, IP test. So it's a, a lab-based test. Now, we'll hear more about the type of monitoring tests in the next couple of talks that are available as well as lab-based things. So then what? Well, the first thing to really do is to assess the risk. Um, you need to know where you're operating. You need to know where the problems may occur. You need to understand the environment that you're working in or storing in, what the turnover is of the fuel that you're using, um, what the history is. Produce a baseline, understand, do the risk assessment. The next thing, as we've all already heard, is, is good housekeeping. Um, there, there isn't really a, an alternative to it. Regular water draining when possible, if it is possible, Regular monitoring we've heard about. We've also mentioned the use of biocides, um, but biocides are not the answer. Biocides have issues. They may actively select for, for other organisms, as we heard earlier. You shouldn't underdose, because if you underdose, it's like not taking a full course of antibiotics, and you run the risk of having resistant strains being produced in the tank. If you overdose, then you'll get problems with the, the engine. You can't just keep throwing in more biocide because more biocide is obviously better. It isn't. There are health and safety issues. You've got to handle the biocide, maybe in very large amounts. Um, and then there's ultimately disposal. You've got tanks, remnants of biocide hanging around. How do you get rid of them? So biocides alone are not the, the part of the solution, but they're not the only solution. So. In summary, I'm afraid I have to say that conditions for growth are probably always there. There's always microorganisms, there's always the fuel, the fuel as a food source, and there's probably always water unless you do something about it. So the best thing is to carry out a risk assessment to see where you're operating, know the system, have a history of, of monitoring, instigate that program and do something about it. Don't just start monitoring and put the results in a file and forget all about it. In microbiology, you're looking for trends. You might have one day, you might have a perfectly happy um, result with nothing there. But then the next day, the next day, the next day, and so on. So you're looking for, for increases, for slow increases, in, ideally in microbial monitoring. So use the data that you've gathered and react to it appropriately. That's all I have to say.